All right. So, uh, so there are various notions for uh, rank that uh, generalize the rank for matrix to higher order tensors. So I will discuss some of those and also one that I introduced myself. Um, but let me start with some, uh, let me start with some uh, um, basic notions of tensor rank. So uh, the general setup would be that we have, say, a tensor product of vector spaces, say V1 up to Vd. Here we work over some field K and, and you know, the VIs are of course K vector spaces. And I assume that the final dimensional. Um, so a simple tensor is a, is a tensor right of the form, you know, V1 tensor V2, et cetera, you know, small Vs with a VI in this vector space VI. And so now we can define uh, the notion of tensor rank. So if, if T is a tensor, an element of V, then the, the tensor rank, I'll just write RK of T is the smallest R, smallest non-negative integer R, such that R at T is a sum of are simple tensors. <clears throat> and so this generalizes the notion of rank of a matrix, because for example, if you have a, a matrix, then uh, the rank of a matrix is just the number of the smallest number R so that you can write this matrix as uh, R matrices of rank one. And uh, so if D is two, then we can think of V as a space of matrices. So, uh, for example, one interesting example is, I think physicists call this a W, if I'm not mistaken. I guess it has some physical significance, but anyway. So this tensor, so, so this is a tensor in, well, let's say C2, tensor C2, tensor C2. That could be another field. And so this, this has rank three, which is not completely obvious because there might be a different way that I could write this as maybe a sum of two simple tensors. But in this case, it's actually rank three. And if a slight variation would be where I maybe add one more thing, just to illustrate that it's maybe not you know, so obvious to see what the rank is. So if I write something like this, then it looks like this might actually, uh, you know, let's try it like this, that it may have rank four, but actually this actually has only rank two because uh, this, this is equal to, you can take uh, say E1 plus E2 and then you take say, uh, I just, this notation means just tensor product of three copies of it, uh, minus E1 minus E2 and you take three copies and uh, I have to divide this by two. So if I write it like this, then we see that the rank of this tensor is at most two. So and the fact that it's equal to two in that example. So one interesting applications of the no notion of tensor rank is the complexity of matrix multiplication. 
Uh, I will not talk too much about that because I also, not too long ago, I wrote, talked about that in the research seminar, but, uh, but uh, so, so does this tensor sometimes denoted by like PQR, which is, uh, let me just write it down. So, so th this is sort of like uh, inside, uh, sort of like C, you know, here Q times R matrices, the space of uh, R times P matrices, tensor C, P times Q matrices. But we think of it as a tensor product of uh, three vector spaces. So this, particular tensor is uh, interesting and closely related to complexity of uh, matrix multiplication. In fact, matrix multiplication is a bilinear map, right? The binary, you know, take two matrices, the product is another matrix. And so as a bilinear map, you can think of it as a tensor lying in the tensor product of three uh, matrix, matrix spaces. Um, so from, can I ask, yes, is it easy to see, or is it, I mean, even easy to state, what is the maximum rank among all sort of sensors? Uh, no, it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> even that is, uh, uh, well, some results are known about that, but also even, even like, uh, if you take sort of a generic tensor, like what is the rank, it's not, not so, not, you know, a lot of things are known about that, but it's not an easy question, I would say. Hmm. So, um, in fact, I was going to say this later, but uh, finding the rank of a tensor is actually quite hard. It's actually entry hard, to be precise, in general. So, and is, and, and is the number of factors in a tensor product? Or, sorry. So, so, so if it, if it's a like for d greater or equal than three, it's kind of hard. For matrices, yeah. you know, rank is easy, but mm -hmm. uh, but for higher order tensors, it can be hard. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. So we have this re result of Strassen that says that if say the rank of this tensor is less or equal than m, then we can uh, multiply. So, so that says something about, you know, multiplying a Q times R matrix and a R times P matrix. But in fact, you get actually something asymptotic for matrices of arbitrary size. So then we can multiply, uh, say, two N by N matrices. Let me just write it. So two, and by n matrices uh, with, you know, the complexity would be three log m over say log pqr. Uh, and the complexity is measured in arithmetic operations. So like one addition or one uh, multiplication will be, you know, cost one, basically. Uh, what is, what is oh. N here? Uh, what is? Did you have PQR oh, yeah. in there? All of a sudden there was a little N. So, so, uh, if we, so the complexity of multiplying N by N matrices. Yes will be O n to the power that exponent. But, oh, and so, but you need, you need, and you need this inequality on the rank for what? For which P's, which Q's and which R's? For, for any P, Q and R, if I have, for any P, Q and R, I have this inequality. Well, I think maybe you should, maybe, 
I don't know. Well, they probably shouldn't be all one. I think that's the only condition because otherwise you get also zero by, by zero. So, but you're assuming this rank, this bound on the this m bound on the rank is uniform in PQ and R. No, if no, if sorry, if for some P, Q, and R and M, we have uh, that, then then we get the result for all M. So I only need to I only need one of these tensors to have small rank. And then I get something asymptotic for all n. And so, in particular, right? So, Strassen also showed that uh, if you, this two to two, which is sort of the, the the tensor that corresponds to multiplying uh, two by two matrices. So, you know, the, the obvious way. Like this, this rank of this tensor, if you look at it, the obvious bound would be, you know, uh, PQR, you know, would be, you know, P times Q times R, because that's how I wrote it. Right. right. So, but instead of eight, it is actually less or equal than seven. In fact, we know now it's equal to seven. And then if you work out what that means, then you get like the complexity for, for matrix multiplication would be uh, n times and then uh, log of seven eighth. Yeah, so you get log log three, of seven four. over you know times three over log eight, which is log seven over log two. Or <clears throat> well, if you worked it out, it's something like two point eight one. Mm -hmm. And the usual, uh, you know, algorithm for multiplying matrices, right? For each entry in the n by n matrix, you have to do like n multiplication. So it's more or less O n cubed. So, so this is the, the fast Strassen uh, multiplication. Um, and this, this oh, sorry, maybe this, this theorem assumes that not only is the rank bounded, but that you have, you are given uh, uh, a decomposition of, you know, PQR into, you know, to, into M simple tensors, because presumably finding that decomposition is probably could be a, a, a complicated problem on, on its own, I assume. Yeah, but, but you could find that in finite num amount of time, though. So. Oh, and, so, and once and for all, you mean? So. Right. So, so for this one tensor, you have to find this decomposition that will uh -huh. take a certain amount of time. But then for all n, you would have this fast algorithm. I see. So, I see. So, you so do for that the asymptotics, it doesn't really matter how long that initial calculation, which is sort of like overhead, how long that will just take. I see. I see. So as I mentioned earlier, so the tensor rank. You know, is is uh, harder or more complicated than sort of matrix rank, but you you see, like in these applications and the many applications of tensors, it's still worthwhile to study it. But uh, you know, I already said okay. sort of like, um, yeah. Sorry, can I can, can I? <laughs> Just a follow-up question to, to Valerio's question. Um, it, if you had an explicit description of this um, kind of tensor that represents mul matrix multiplication, if you had an explicit description of it as a simple tensor, sum of seven simple tensors, yeah, would this give an algorithm for? Yes. Okay. And and uh, and Carson gave a very explicit example formula that I don't know by heart, but. Uh, I mean, you can find the many books and you can implement this algorithm and, you know, has been implemented and it is faster, like if matrices are large enough. Um, uh, but the, this result of stars and also has improved. So now we have much better bonds, but kind of the newer results, they're somewhat more theoretical because uh, the improvements may not pay, pay off for any matrices that we would multiply in, in real life. But 
<clears throat> so so the ten, calculating the tensor rank is NP hard. Um, Another interesting thing is that's different for tensors is that the, you know, the set, uh, maybe, maybe call this XR, the set of all tensors, you know, V is V1 of tensor up to VD, the rank of T is less or equal than R. If you consider this set, then it's, it's not always uh, so risky closed. You know, the best you can say is more or less that it's a constructible set, but um, it, it doesn't have to be as risky closed set. But not even um, not even locally closed. Uh. Uh, I think we don't know that. So I probably would say yes. Probably not even locally closed. But okay. I, I, I'm not sure of. That's at least what I would guess. I'm not sure if that's really known. Okay. <clears throat> now, also, if you use the, the usual, like if you work with the real numbers or complex numbers, or just use like the Euclidean metric. Uh, So if, uh, if the fields are or the complex numbers, there may not be the best, you know, rank R approximation. Now, there are actually many applications of tensors like for example also in data science and you know then you kind of work more numerically so so you might have some tensor that may have some noise so you might want to have like a try to approximate a tensor with the low rank tensor uh, but but there's also that's not quite numerical stable and you know the, because sometimes there's not really a, a best approximation of rank r or maybe there is one, but but uh, if you look at the sermons, they might be very huge compared to the tensor itself. So, sorry, Harm, can you say can you say a bit more what you mean by the, the fact that there may not be a best rank a rank R approximation? I'm not sure I understood the statement. Oh yeah, so so if you if you, given a tensor. You could look at the rank R tensors that is closest with respect to the Euclidean metric. Mm -hmm. But since, since the set is not closed, is, there's no guarantee that, that uh, there's such a closest one would exist. Uh, uh, uh. Um, so in some sense, it's kind of a corollary to two. Now for matrices, if you have like a block diagonal matrix, then the rank is just the sum of the ranks of the blocks. Um, that, that's actually also not true for tensors. But uh, a counter example was only found recently actually. But uh, so if I, I just write like a direct sum of two tensors, it's not always equal to uh, the sum of the ranks. And you can also look at the tensor product, but there's different notions of tensor product. So, so let's say T lies in V1 tensor VD, and then S lies in maybe some other tensor product with also D factors. Then you can take sort of the Kronecker tensor product, uh, 
which which I usually denote by this because you could also uh, so it's just a tensor product, but you view it in the tensor product of these spaces. So it's still a tensor of order D. So if you take like the Kronecker product, you know, the Kronecker tensor product of two matrices, the rank is multiplicative, but here the rank is not multiplicative. So it's clear that you have this inequality, but, but not always equal, equal. And, and this, this has been known for a long time. Uh, like, uh, <clears throat> so even back to, you know, going back to Strauss and so the sense is that if you take, uh, anyway, it has something to do with this asymptotics. To uh, deal with some of these complications, um, there's also this notion of uh, border rank. So remember, I defined this XR to be the set of all tensors such that have rank at most R. And so now we could define the border rank of T is the smallest R such that um, the stanza actually lies in this risk closure of this set. So that's kind of an easy way to get around it. But anyway, so people have also been interested in this notion of a border rank. So if we go back to this example earlier, the stanza that I call W, Well, we already saw, or I already stated that the rank is three, but the border rank is actually two. If you define this, say, W epsilon to be the E1 plus epsilon times E2, and then you take tensor that with itself and itself, and you subtract E1 tensor E1 tensor E1, so then, it, and then we let epsilon go to zero, but, but first I divide by epsilon. Okay. So then if epsilon goes to zero, then this converges to W. Well, let's say we work of the complex numbers, but you know, if you work over an arbitrary field, you have to kind of make sense of this limit in a different way. And I'll talk about that later, but anyway. Uh, so you see that this rank three tensor is a limit of rank two tensors. So in other words, the set of rank tensors of rank at most two is not closed. And of course we know like for matrices, such things are always closed, right? Because uh, if you look at all the matrices of rank at most R, they're defined by the minus, by the R plus one times R plus one minus. So that is a nice risky closed set. Okay, so, so those are two notions, the rank and the border rank. So those are maybe most widely studied. Uh, now I'm talking, discussing one uh, newer notion of rank. This is in many ways quite different, but also interesting with applications, which is called the slice rank. And I will also explain the relation to the cap set problem, which is a problem in combinatorics or additive number theory. Uh, and so, Uh, so the slice rank, well, so that there's this proof uh, related to this cap set problem by uh, Allenberg and Gaysweight just a few years ago. And then uh, 
Terence Tao uh, wrote about it in his blog, and he kind of introduced this notion uh, of slice rank to give sort of a nice presentation of, of that proof. And so, uh, so let me give the definition of the slice rank. So first of all, let me first define what means to be slice rank one. So a tensor uh, T has a slice rank one if uh, T lies in, in a set of this form And here I just put one vector. You know, for some i and some vector w i and v i. <laughs> if if you think of this as some kind of like hypercube, then it's the t the support of this t lies somehow in some slice in in a way anyway. That's probably why it was called slice rank. Um, so if we go back to this example, I mean, I'm not going to write it down again. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't say what sli arbitrary slice rank is. So then, in ge for a general tensor, you know, the, the slice rank. T is the smallest R such that T is a sum of R tensors of slice rank one. And so the, the example from earlier with the standard that I call W, the slice rank is just two. So for many, it, it generally may be easier to determine what the slice rank is, but in fact, it's also known that's actually also NP hard and border rank is also NP hard. So, um, but one difference is the slice rank generally doesn't have like, cannot be quite as large. So uh, for example, for an N by N by N tensor, the tensor rank could be as high as roughly N square over three. And uh, that's just an easy dimension count that there must be many tensors that have a rank around that size. Uh, but the slice rank can never be more than the dimension of one of these spaces. So, so in other words, the slice rank of a tensor is less or equal than the minimum dimension of, of all these dim VIs. So one nicer property is here that if you look at the set of all, um, you know, there's one thing that Tau proved. But, you know, it's kind of standard technique. If you, if you look at the, all the tensors for which the slice rank is at most R, then this is, this is already so risky closed. So there's no need for a border slice rank, so to speak. So, so what is, let's do a different color. Let me talk about the cap set problem that I mentioned earlier. The various generalizations, but the, the the usual statement is suppose we have a subset S of F3 to the power N, so N dimensional fine space, 
And suppose it does not contain uh, an affine line or you can also think of it as an arithmetic progression. So, so what is the largest cardinality of S? Um, so very until recently, well, well, various results are known. Like it's obvious that S can be, uh, for example, can have. You can find easily some S that has like two to power n elements. And I think somebody actually proved that to something like two point two to power n. The upper bounds was always hard, so. Um, so there were various improvements, but it was always like r to the power n times some function, like something like three to the power n divided by n, or maybe something divided by something bigger. But so, so there was a recent recent uh, breakthrough by um, Allenberg and Geis, right? So Jordan Allen, Burke, and John Geis, right? It's a beautiful Dutch name. Uh, so, and they proved that S is, well, it can even make small O of 2.756. But it's, it's actually some algebraic number. Uh, in fact, I think I put it down somewhere. Uh, Aharm, just a quick uh, question. Is there any uh, specific reason that this problem is only formulated for a field with three elements? Uh, I think that's the original cap set, but I mean, people also have a look at say, f q to power n. Uh, so set, subsets of f q to the power n that don't have arithmetic progressions, and the similar results. And I think Allenberg and Geisweit also had results for that. But uh, but I'll, I'll just take to this one formulation. But but uh, in fact, before before this result of Allenberg Geisweit, there were also I forgot maybe. I mean, some people also look at uh, Z modulo four to the power n. Uh, anyway, um, so so anyway, so there are many like combinatorial problems that are related. Um, oh yeah. <clears throat> so what what is this number precisely? It, it's really Really, what they proved is uh, O theta to the power n, where uh, theta is one plus r plus r square over r two thirds. And r is square root 33 minus one over eight. <clears throat> and you know it actually comes from uh, you know if you look at this function somehow this function plays a role and if you try to minimize this for x positive then <clears throat> then basically you get this theta okay so the optimal solution is for x is equal to r and then you get this theta so so that's what it is more precisely. And so this theta is roughly, you know, that number here. Um, 
So I want to, maybe I'll say a little bit about the proof because it's so nice, but, and, and, and to see like how it's related to the slice rank. Okay, so where does that slice rank come in here? Uh, well, it's not a complete proof, but part of the proof. So the proof uses the so-called polynomial method. I should have remembered the names of people that use that for the C module four case, but. And it also uses the slice rank. And so we, we construct a tensor. So, so first of all, we work over the field with three elements, but not only that, we look at the space, you know, F3 to power three to the power N. <clears throat> okay. And the basis is given by, well, we also enumerate them by vectors. So, so uh, I parameterize them by also elements in F3 to the power N. Okay, so that, that's a little bit confusing. So I work over F3, but then the basis elements are also parameterized by uh, things in F3 to the power N. But you can kind of think of this vector space as uh, functions from arbitrary functions from F3 to the power N to F3. Okay, so then you get the space of this dimension. And the tensor that we're going to consider, let's call it Tn, is the sum of all A, B, and C in F3 to the power N, for which the sum is equal to zero. So what does it mean that the sum is zero? That, that actually means that there's an arithmetic progression. So the sum of three vectors is zero here, either A is equal to B is equal to C, or they form a fine line. Uh, in other words, the, an arithmetic progression. And so, and then I can take this A tensor B tensor C. So this lies in the space F3 to the power, 3 to the power N tensor F3, 3 to the power N tensor F3, or 3 to the power N, okay. So we have this big tensor. And so then we have an, a lemma that says, uh, suppose, We have cap set. Then the cardinality of S is less or equal than the slice rank of this tensor. So this, this is not so hard to see. Um, yeah. So we, we can compare, so, so we can look at this tensor, right? This tensor is equal to this. But now I could, maybe I could only look at this a, B plus C, where A and B and C lie in S. Okay, so we compare these two tensors. Now one, I'm not going to give the details, but it, it's not hard to see that the slice rank of this tensor is greater equal is greater equal than the slice rank of this tensor. In some sense, it's basically just, you know, some, some elements in, uh, or some of these basis factors just go to zero. So in other words, this is just going to be a projection 
for each of these three vector spaces is going to be some projection. And if you do these projections, then the slice rank will never go up. <clears throat> In fact, uh, you could also think of uh, like a group action and you could actually probably see that this tensor, that this tensor here lies in the Zariski closure of an orbit of this uh, tensor. And so then with this, uh, so that also would prove that. But if you think about what this is, well, if A, B and C are an S, well, S doesn't have any arithmetic progression. So the only way that's possible is if A and B, A is equal to B is equal to C. Okay, so this, this tensor is actually just equal to this. Right here. Where A runs over S. And then, you know, then you can, one can also prove that the tensor like this, the slice rank will be at least S. So that's basically the proof of this lemma. So uh, basically you get <clears throat> this inequality, the cardinality of S is less equal than the slice rank of this tensor Tn. And then, uh, well, then you have to also give an upper bound for the slice rank of the n. And uh, maybe I'll just won't say too much about that, but the basic thing is that we can uh, use a base change. So instead of, uh, <clears throat> for example, in F3 cube, we had the basis one, sorry, let's say basis zero, one, and two. is a basis, but now we could also choose a, a different basis. Maybe it's curly one, which is zero plus one plus two. And uh, maybe go one X. So basically these are the functions. So, uh, so the coefficients are the function values. So the constant function one is just, you know, on zero it has value one, on one it has value one, on two it has value one. The function x is zero on, on zero, and if I plug in one, I get one. If I plug in two, I get two. A similar x square. This is uh, uh, one, and two squares also one. Okay, so I can use this basis instead. And uh, yeah, so maybe I may won't give too many details, but but in this in this basis, it turns out that if you look at uh, the support of this, you know, anyway. So so you do this in F three cubed, but then like in F three to power three to power n, we have basis, you know, uh, all say m, where m is a monomial in, in n variables and degree in each variable is less equal than two. Anyway, if you if you change the basis in this way, then this this T n this tensor becomes simpler in a way, um, and then you can kind of look at you know which which tensor product of which basis vectors appear, and from that you can actually give uh, a bound. But uh, I don't have too much time. I think I better uh, leave it at that.
But you know, this is sort of part of this polynomial method where you look in, you know, here is where the polynomial sort of, sort of appear. Okay. So uh, so now I will talk about the G-stable rank, which is in many ways related to the slice rank. So G-stable rank. <clears throat> uh, kind of works when K is a perfect field. And, and it's related to geometric invariant theory. In particular, it will use some results of uh, CAMP and uh, you know, those results require perfect field, but nothing else really. So I'm thinking of, a, a, I'm going to think about group actions. That's sort of my perspective. So I, I'm looking at the action of this group on, on this vector space V, which was the tensor product of these D vector spaces. Now, uh, like from the geometric invariant, you know, if from the invariant theory point of view, uh, it's not so interesting in the sense that there are no no non-constant invariants for this group action. In other words, if I if I have any tensor, if V is any element in, in V, then zero lies in the closure of this orbit. This is quite obvious. So the so-called null Hilbert's null cone would be everything. But, but one question what we'd ask is, um, so, so, well, okay, let me first define a one parameter subgroup. So this is also, you know, there's this Hilbert Mumford criterion. So one parameter subgroup is a uh, homomorphism of algebraic groups. Of you know what I often call the multiplicative group, which is just you know GL one K uh, to our group G. Well, that's it. Sorry. <laughs> As, I mean, you can make this definition for any algebraic group G. So this is one parameter subgroup. Uh, and sort of in, in general, we have this Hilbert Mumford criterion, right? So if, if, if V is a re representation of uh, G, and so for, for now, let, let's say that this G could be arbitrary uh, reductive group and V any like representation, then we have the following. Uh, Hilbert Mumford criterion. Um, if V is in V and say, well, let me just serialize in the orbit closure of V, then we can actually use this one parameter subgroup to send V to this to zero. So then there exists a one parameter subgroup, lambda, with the limit. Again, one has to interpret that in the right way. But if you apply lambda t times V, and you take the limit t goes to zero, then this is equal to zero. So, so that that that's actually a very useful criterion, uh, in some sense that make this problem more tractable 
if you want to know if something lies in a null cone or whether something is semi stable, you have to know if, if zero lies in this orbit closure. And uh, essentially, this Hilbert Munford criterion reduces this problem to the case where this group is like a toes and, and then it becomes kind of more combinatorial. Right, so, so let me just, so in geometric invariant theory, we say that zero, uh, so there's this Hilbert's null cone, which is the set of all V and V, for which zero lies in the orbit closure. And everything that's not in here, this is, you know, the set of, uh, in this, semi-stable elements in V. So like I said before, like this, this limit might not quite make sense if you don't work with the complex or real numbers. Uh, and, and this risky, risky topology is not, not how stuff. So, but I mean, there's an easy way to make sense out of this, right? So, if uh, if 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 say if you have a Laurent polynomial, then this limit. Well, we can just define it as, well, P of zero, if P T was actually a polynomial. And otherwise, you know, it doesn't exist. Otherwise. And um, you could also do this for vectors, right? So if if PT was actually a vector of Laurent polynomials, then uh, again, uh, this would be just uh, P of zero if PT it's actually just a vector of polynomials and, and, and then not defined, doesn't exist otherwise. So that's, that's kind of what I mean with these limits of an arbitrary field. And for the, so the, the definition of G-stable rank uses one parameter subgroup, so uh, so that's why I'm, I'm giving these definitions. Uh, and then, of course, we also have the the val t valuation, right? So so if you have a, a Laurent polynomial, the t valuation of p t is r if if p t can be written uh, as say t to the power r times q t, where QT is a polynomial and you choose R maximal. So in other words, this QT should not lie in the ideal generated by T. In other words, QT has valuation zero. And then similarly, you know, if PT is a vector, then, you know, valuation of PT is uh, you know, the minimum of evaluations of these PITs. So if you go back to our situation, oh, well, uh, but let's, let's first go to back to, uh, So, 
uh, a one parameter subgroup, lambda t, like, for example, if, if, uh, if you have one parameter subgroup in GLV, then I'll call it uh, is polynomial. If uh, lambda t, well, it, it lies, lies in, maybe I'll write like this here, and v, I mean, lambda t as a matrix is just given by polynomials. Maybe I'll write it like this. And then uh, similar, if lambda t is a one parameter subgroup in GL, in this group G that I defined earlier. If, um, right, so if, this lambda, right, is, is like an n tuple, or let's say d tuple. If if lambda i t is polynomial, okay. So. Yeah, so this is all kind of preparation for this uh, definition of G-stable rank. So it's not super easy to define, but so, so the idea is like, we know that zero lies in the closure of the orbit in this situation, but the question is, you know, how fast can you make it go to zero, right? With respect to some measure. So that, that's sort of where this idea of G-stable rank comes from. Okay, <clears throat> so we want this lambda t to send some vector v to zero as quickly as possible, but this lambda t should also be small in terms of, you know, how big of a polynomials you actually need to, uh, or, you know, how big this sort of is within GLPI. So anyway, so, so the, so the measures come from this slope here. So we define, so if, if uh, V is in V and uh, lambda T is a one parameter subgroup, actually polynomial, one parameter subgroup, of GL uh, of G and let's say the valuation of lambda T V is positive. So in other words, this limit is actually zero. Then we define the slope you know, called mu lambda t with respect to v is the following. So we take the sum of the valuations t of the determinants of the lambda i and then divide it by the valuation t lambda t V. So one thing that you see is if I replace t by t square, then I get a one another one parameter subgroup, but that will not change this quotient. And uh, so this determinant, this lambda i t is polynomial. So with respect to some basis, it's going to be a diagonal matrix where the diagonal elements are positive or non-negative powers of t. And so that determinant being small, that, that kind of bounds these exponents. Uh, so anyway, so, so this is the ratio. And then, so finally we define the G-stable rank. Uh, 
So it's the minimum of all one parameter subgroups for these conditions, right? So that valuation here is positive of this slope. So that's, that's kind of a, a precise definition. Uh, so let, let's go to an example because uh, this. Again, a running example is W tensor. So what's the G-stable rank of this? Now, it, it kind of this optimal one parameter subgroup is uh, where we take lambda i t for all i, we take it equal to, we multiply E1 by T and E2 by one. And we do that for each of the modes in each of these three vector spaces. So then the slope of this lambda T with respect to W is, well, these determinants, right? I'll write again, definition. So each determinant is just T, so it has valuation one. So this is one plus one plus one is three. And the denominator, the valuation of lambda times T applied to W, while each of these terms like E1 and this, and this E1 is multiplied by T and E2 is multiplied by one. So this whole thing, W is actually just multiplied by T squared. And so this valuation is just two. So the slope is three over two, which shows that the G-stable rank of W is less equal than three over two. But, but actually uh, it's equal. So here you see an interesting thing that this, this G-stable rank is actually, uh, can be a rational numbers, so doesn't have to be, um, doesn't have to be an integer. So, uh, so I don't know, uh, my time's up here. I don't know, can I have more time or, I know there's another talk after this, so. Uh, yeah, there's another talk at 10 past, maybe just another couple of minutes. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So, Maybe I'll at least say some basic properties. So first of all, we can compare to the slice rank. And in some sense, it's close to the slice rank. So, so first of all, we talked about the rank of a tensor. Uh, yeah. We also talked about you know, the border rank, which is always less equal than the rank. The border rank is also, I didn't mention this, but it's also it's greater equal than the slice rank. And the slice rank is always greater equal than the G-stable rank. And the G-stable rank is at least two over D times the slice rank. So in some sense, the slice rank and G-stable rank are close in the sense that they're the same up to a constant, which depends on D. Um, you know, the, the slice rank behaves nice. I mean, this is also true for slice, sorry, the uh, slice rank. And also I think for direct sum, it's true for, I, we have equality. I'm not, not actually sure if this is true for slice rank. It may also be true for slice rank. Now here's a property which I call super multiplicativity. So remember um, for the rank, 
the rank of a tensor product of this Kronecker tensor product is always less equal than the product of the ranks, but it's actually not always equal. Now here, we actually have the inequality in the other direction. And it's also not always equal. For the slice rank, either inequality is not always true. So, so in that sense, it's nicer than the slice rank. And uh, maybe I'll skip this one. Uh, one. One nice thing about this is also that over the complex numbers, we have also another definition of the slice rank. We take the supremum over all G in this group G that we defined earlier, over where you take the minimum over all I. And so you take here the Euclidean norm, so you apply this group element and then you take the Euclidean norm of that. And then, so this phi i is the so-called i's flattening. So uh, phi i of a tensor is T viewed as a matrix in, you know, in this tensor product V i and then here. But then, you know, you skipped V i. So, so this process is called flattening. To view this tensor, you can view as a matrix, and then this matrix has, a, you know, a spectral norm, which is now easy to compute. Spectral norm or operator norm, and then this is Euclidean norm. So, so th this this gives you maybe a, a numerical way to compute or approximate this G-stable rank or at least to give lower bounds. And, and so, uh, which is useful, for example, for the slice rank, it's, it's kind of, that they're not, there's not a formula like this for the slice rank. Uh, and so, so the last thing I wanna say is, uh, let's go back to the cap set problem. So if we go back, we had that this cardinality of S is less than equal than the slice rank of Tn, but it's actually also less than equal than the rank, G-stable rank, which may, may give you a sharper bound. And in fact, for smaller, you know, for, well, anyway, this gives you a sharper bound, although it's only an improvement up to a constant, but for small n, that's still useful. And even asymptotically, now the, the uh, bound by uh, Geistreit and Ellenberg didn't say anything about constants. In fact, uh, my student, uh, Zhe Jiang, um, he actually improved this bound of Geisweit and Ellenberg. So he proved that this cardinality is actually O of this theta to the power N, but you can actually divide by square root N. So, so it, it, it's, it's a asymptotic improvement. And in fact, he also gives more precise bounds even where you have a constant times theta to the power n over square root n, and then say one plus, say small o of one. So approximately theta to the power n over square root n, where, where this theta was again, this number from before. And then some constant explicit to constant. And so using the G-stable rank, instead of the slice rank will then improve this constant. The improvement of square root n is, is sort of, uh, comes from something else that is just goes down to estimating the number of certain number of monomials, which then in the end boils down to computing a fairly complicated integral or estimating an integral. Uh, maybe I'll leave it to you, please. Thank you.